women involved. It's, and it's obviously terrible for the baby, as you say, but also for the women. So, I don't know, I, I find this very disturbing, and, and it is going to probably go through, as you say. Yeah. What do you think, Francis? Well, I, to be honest with you, I'm not particularly comfortable with it either. I think that it... What you're doing is you're leaving the door wide open to having end-stage end abortions, which I don't think most people would be in agreement with. I don't understand why we're changing the law. The law seems to work very well in this country. It's not a contentious issue. It seems to be a, a kind of done deal. But now we're opening up this proverbial can of worms, and I, th I don't agree with it. And actually, I, I think if you went on the British High Street and asked most people, they wouldn't agree with it either. Right. And also, it's being driven by government and big, and big business. The system doesn't want people to have babies because then the government has to pay for the, all the health care and the schooling and everything. Uh, big business just wants uh, fully grown workers imported immediately <laughs> across, across an open border. Yeah. Well, we, we're supposed to provide balance across the day, so hopefully someone on another show had a different yeah. view because we all agree on that one. Let's have a look at the I Weekend then, Leo. I didn't even know they had a weekend version, but there you go. They do, and uh, it leads with the UK offers Russian officials British citizenship to defect and pass secrets to MI6. So any potential Soviet defectors, I'm going to say Soviet because <laughs> essentially are, <laughs> are being are in Putin's, uh, Putin's um, cabinet or, or any other Russian officials, are being offered British citizenship uh, and money. Uh, and in the eye, they suggest that Russian officials who are appalled with the war in Ukraine uh, could be motivated by this. I think the money and the British citizenship mm. is more of a motivating factor than uh, and, and the desire to sort of stay alive as, yeah. as Putin throws... Uh, throws accomplice after accomplice out of hospital windows. Um, so, uh, yeah, th I think if you're a Russian official, you're probably not that tortured by moral dilemmas. Yeah. You're not going to be like, oh, the war, war in Ukraine is so terrible. Um, don't, I mean, they own, don't they own all the houses in London anyway? Well, they same the, and the Chinese and the Arabs. OK. So, yeah, absolutely. I think what they're trying to do is, because of the death of Alexei Navalny last week, what they're trying to do is reach out to these officials and go, look, it might, might be you next. Have a think about it, Sergey. Mm. Why not come and live over happen here? happen in the Arctic Circle. Exactly, mm. exactly. The come and live over here where you might get stabbed. The, yeah, the only problem, problem with, uh, with this idea of like, offering people sanctuary in Britain is yeah. that Putin has a habit of killing people in Britain. Like yeah. Berezovsky was, uh, was found hanged. Uh, obviously, you know, didn't didn't kill himself. I don't think that's a conspiracy theory to, to say that. So, yeah, you, you won't be safe in Britain. Just a few days ago, uh, a Russian defector who uh, was in the military flew, and he flew um, a, a helicopter, a Russian helicopter, into Ukraine and defected to, to Ukraine and then took up a, a new life in Spain. He was killed in Spain by Russian Secret Service agents. Well, yeah. maybe he just drank some bad tea, mate. That and that's disappointing after you've flown a helicopter. I mean, that should be the rule. If you can fly a helicopter into a country, you get to stay there yeah. and get left alone. That should be the rule. Yeah, exactly. But I don't really think, even if that was a rule, I don't think Putin would play by them. Yeah. How dare you? And one good, one good bit of news about the, the war in Russia, it's not in this story, but, um, but Ukraine just shot down an A-50, and these, are, these cost about, you know, half a billion mm. dollars... And uh, they're a big sort of command and control aircraft with radar and everything. And Russia only had eight of them before the war. And Ukraine, uh, well, a combination of Ukraine and Russian air defence itself has shot down three of them. You know more about the military workings of that war than most people in the Russian military and the Ukrainian <laughs> military. It's unbelievable. Which I don't is, they like Which it. isn't much, to be honest. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, your baby is completely neglected, but you know everything about <laughs> which tanks they're using. Yeah. It's incredible. All right, let's have a quick look at the Daily Mail then, Francis. OK, so the Daily Mail has gone with the story of a particularly gruesome murder uh, of a transgender woman, 26, smiles after being found guilty of murdering random stranger on night out. In an inspired killing with a... I can't... Don't F with cats is the name of the documentary on Netflix. And it's, a, it's an awful story where uh, this person went out, didn't know the victim, battered and strangled them to death, and just for, just for the sheer pleasure of doing so, an awful, awful story. The gentleman in question uh, came to this country looking for a better life, was an electronic engineer worked for BMW and his life was ended in the most callous and brutal manner possible. 
It's an awful story. It's heartbreaking. It, it, the Daily Mail then goes in to talk about, you know, the statements from the parents and your heart has to bleed for them. Tragic, awful story. What? And this person shouldn't see the light of day. I've got to... Uh, I've got to say that, for all that we're told, that transgender people are victimised and at a higher rate of, uh, of murders and violence and all the rest of it, it seems to be the other way around. They seem to be at a higher rate of, of dishing out violence. So yeah. many mass shootings in America. There was one recently, uh, the church shooting. Uh, there, was, there was one in a school, a hor horrific uh, shooting, where the, and it was clearly motivated by this, uh, you know, victimhood that's, that's spread by the, the left around yeah. uh, transgender ideology. Uh, so they were shooting Christian kids at this Christian school mm. uh, as sort of revenge against them. So, uh, I don't know, I think uh, maybe there's, there's parts of gender ideology that need to be, uh, need to be looked at because it seems to be uh, radicalising people to, to commit crimes. I'm, Look, not, I'm not saying that happened in this instance, but I, you know, I don't, some of the mass shootings. Yeah, absolutely, but I don't think that happened in this in instance. This seems to be a deeply, deeply sick individual who started off torturing animals, in, particularly cats, and then moved on right. to human yeah. beings. That is often a trait of psychopaths. If you mm. watch the documentaries, they start with cats and animals. Weird. Mm. All right, let's very quickly have a look at the Daily Star then, Leo. Yeah, so National Pride takes another knock as the roast dinner loses its title as number one meal to spaghetti bolognese, which is an Italian dish. I is believe it? I believe it's from from Italy. So they say Mamma Mia, which uh, is, uh, is oh, that makes sense. It's yeah, Italian that's what Italians say. My yeah. mum. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like, if, if you have a roast dinner, you say My mum, mm. and in Italy they say Mamma Mia. It sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. So, sound better, man. Yeah, this is apparently you know the final nail in the coffin of the British Empire. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it for part one. But coming up, truth bombs from Sweller Bradman and actual bombs in Plymouth. Stay tuned. <laughs> Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Claire, you, you want to talk by cars growing by a couple of centimetres a year? Yeah, well, one centimetre every two years. Okay. It's unrelenting because the um, people are so, so fixated on the big SUVs, the sales have gone through the roof, and yet it's um, James Nix, the analyst for Transport and Environment campaign, said the author of the report on the trend said, spurred on by sales of the largest SUVs, vehicles are getting wider every year. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that our it's roads more weren't... comfortable ride, beautiful <laughs> engines. <laughs> I mean, it's luxury, it's gorgeous. Well, as I know, I used to have uh, two, um, but I, I don't... Used to have two SUVs? Well, one SUV at time but I had two brands right. of them um, but I'd no longer drive in London now because I just don't see the point because of the ULEs, because of the you know you can yeah. run down a thing and get fined. Parking spaces, whatever. Is, yeah. yeah the growth in car size also causes issues for their drivers. The report found that largely luxury SUVs which are about two metres wide no longer fit in off street parking. That's true. They also leave too little space for passengers to get in and out of the vehicles in typical off street spaces and they're about two 2.4 metres wide, the report found. Well, and I'll tell you, I was stuck in a bus last night trying to get uh -oh. home, and the buses couldn't move because the streets were too crammed with all of these massive cars mm. either side. Chelsea track. And it was gridlocked. Yeah, maybe they're not the problem, maybe the buses are the problem. Yeah. Buses take people to their place of well, work and well, get I'd them I'd like home. to know when, because when I go through London, all I see is empty buses. Empty well, you're buses. lucky. Every time I'm on one, they're full. Well, they're obviously only full at rush hour. Mm. You see, the thing is, uh, property developers, when they do high-rise car parks or, you know, they build a, a multiplex cinema and there's a car park attached to it, that's not my fault that I can't fit into their space. <laughs> the, it's, you know, it's their fault. So well, what, it's all why? driven by what? money, isn't it? The more spaces well, that they have, exactly. the more people they can get. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Nick Dixon, still here with military historian Leo Kurse. There he is. And podcaster and activist Francis Foster. <laughs> I just wrote that for fun. No yeah. idea what it means. Let's do the mail. And Swella Braverman claims the Islamists are in charge of Britain. I, for one, am appalled by this true statement, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Swella Braverman in the, uh, has claimed that the Islamists are in charge of Britain. And look, what she is talking about is this disgraceful incident with the Speaker of the House of Commons ripping up the Commons rule book because he said he was worried about the safety of MPs from Islamists. And what that sends out a very powerful statement, which is, we will capitulate at the slightest pressure from extremist groups. And if that being the case, you, you have to ask, is... Suella actually incorrect in what she says. Yeah, it, may, it might be hyperbole for now, but it's certainly a, a, not a great portent, is it, Leo? I mean, well, yeah, and she's probably seen what's happened in other countries, like Lebanon, you know, a formerly uh, Christian-majority mm. country. Uh, you know, so the, these things don't always end in the, the sort of roses and buttercups that leftists imagine. And I think there have been... It's, it's interesting that it's, it's happening to politicians now. I'm sort of relieved in a way that politicians are being uh, attacked and threatened by Islamists mm. because, you know, regular people have had it for ages. There's the grooming yeah. gangs, there's Salman Rushdie, not that I'm yeah. suggesting Salman Rushdie is a, a common man, but, uh, you know, other people, the Batley Grammar teacher. Yeah. Uh, so there's been... And obviously all the, all the terror attacks and stuff. So people have been, uh, you know, living living under the cosh of uh, threats from uh, Islamic extremism for a, for a while. And this sort of de facto um, blasphemy law, you, when, when a Quran was, was scuffed at a school in Wakefield, mm -hmm. um, you know, the mother put on, a, put on a headscarf and did this grovelling apology in front of the, the Muslim elders. Hopefully now that it's the elites that are being targeted, something will actually get done. Or maybe they'll just capitulate quicker. But what's very interesting, Trigon Orange, she has an exclusive interview with Suella coming out on Tuesday. Oh, that nice. shameless plug. Not heard of it, but let me just... <laughs> let me just this, though. <laughs> Let me make this one point, Leo. Interesting point you, you make about now it's affecting politicians. What I find particularly baffling, though, is that it already had affected them oh, because yeah. Sir David Amos was murdered. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's already affected them, but they still don't wake up. L yeah. Lindsay Hoyle, the speaker, you shared a clip on X, and actually it turned out to be from February 1st, yeah. but it's still very much applied. After Mike Freer had stepped down, he was doing all the usual, oh, white nationalists this, lone wolf that, and it's like, why can't they address the massive elephant in the room. I mean, yeah. Maybe they're afraid, which is reasonable, but God... But, but I remember when that, with the murder of Sir David Amos, it was a couple of years ago now, awful, awful, obviously. Everybody then came on, including on this channel, and started to talk about, you know, hate speech on the, on, online. And they, they blamed the murder of Sir David Amos on that instead yeah. of what it actually was, which is a psychopath who was an Islamist. Yeah, I don't recall that on this channel, but I know what you mean. It, yeah. was, it was gaslighting. And here's a, I mean, is Suella's thing, her statement here, really that far-fetched that Islamists have taken over? Could they take over? Because if you look at elite theory, right, I'm not exactly an academic, but the claim is that, um, that a, a, an organised minority always wins over a disorganised majority, which is yeah. how we have a liberal elite now that ignores all the wishes of the country. Yeah. It's, so surely, in theory, an Islamic party could come in in future and take over, and, and that would be the party. Is that so unfeasible? It happened in Michelle it's called, Welbeck's It's called the Labour Party. <laughs> uh, we're, we're already seeing that Islamists are forcing, through their bullying, through their intimidation, through, you know, threats to rape the wives of politicians, really horrible stuff. And, you know, let's, let's be honest, if this was, if this was uh, you know, somebody who's considered far right by, by, by everyone, the, the, the system would come down on them like a ton of bricks. Yeah. Uh, but they're, they're forcing parliamentary changes and decisions. They're already forcing through uh, those changes in parliament. So, yes, they're in, they're in control. Yeah, and I suppose on a more cynical level, this might be Swella Bradman's bid to stay visible as a leadership yeah. candidate, but... She doesn't need to. She's on trigonometry. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Coming up. All right, let's do the, the times. And one military situation we're actually in control of is World War II, Leo. <laughs> 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 So there's, uh, there's been a, a bomb uh, discovered, a Second World War bomb discovered in Plymouth and thousands have been uh, evacuated as this is transported through the city to be detonated at sea. That's not some sort of like carnival float mm. type situation where they, uh, they, they just had to sort of take it through the city. It's, it's been deemed that it's, it's not uh, viable to do a sort of controlled explosion on land. Mm. So what they're going to do is they're going to stick it on a boat and just carry it out to sea and just chuck it off the side. Yeah. Like somebody flat they're basically fly-tipping with this... <laughs>
with this bomb. Well, you know what? France have been absolutely no help with this whole <laughs> migrant crisis, so I think it's the very least the French deserve. Let's just dump it off Calais. Go, there you go, Pascal. Deal with that. I love where it's always Pascal. <laughs> I wonder if I have to apologise for your <laughs> anti-French Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there you go, go Pascal. Mate. Yeah, have that, yeah, yeah. Claude. You're what? like that guy that hit the, ter the terrorist guy said, I'm Millwall. Yeah. You're like, yeah. here you go, Pascal, go on. Yeah. Well, if this was Russia, if we were Russia, then this, this bomb would be taken to the front line. They're literally using uh, munitions from there the Second again. World War. They're using T-55s. You claim propaganda. T-55s, <laughs> these terrible <laughs> tanks. From... I told you, Leo knows the names of every bomb. You know what I like about Leo old. is that he's got a kid, but he's got the soul of a virgin. <laughs> 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 All right, we can't top that. Let's do the Guardian now. Shemima Begum, Francis. Yeah, uh, again. yeah. It's Jemima Began loses appeal against removal of British citizenship. So lawyers of Shemima Began have vowed to keep fighting, uh, appropriate, to bring her home after they failed in a fresh attempt to overturn a decision against her. So Sajid Javid, the former Home Secretary, effectively made uh, Shemima stateless because he said that her crimes were so heinous and they represented a very real and pertinent threat to the British people that she should not be allowed back in. So she is now in a refugee camp in northeastern Syria. This is the latest appeal that her lawyers have presented to the British courts, and they have failed once again. So Shemima is not coming home. Yeah, it, also, it all turns on this deprivation decision, mm. which was deemed... Uh, there was an appeal about whether that was unlawful, but they concluded it wasn't. And this is to do with whether uh, British Muslims are disproportionately affected by this so-called deprivation. That's the technicality, but what do you think, Leo? Deport? Uh, well, I feel the, the whole world don't need to because she's not in the yeah, country. No, but right. I, I feel like she's been made a scapegoat for a, a wider issue that we were just talking about, which is the, the growth of radical Islam in the UK. And uh, quite often this is at, like the Green Lane Mosque in, in Birmingham, uh, which is funded or was funded by the, by the taxpayer. Diversity uh, is our strength, Leo. It's absolutely insane. So on the one hand, we've got a government and a system that's, that's encouraging uh, funding and uh, allowing radical Islam to ferment uh, and allow, allowing hate preachers to, to go pretty much, you know, around doing, doing what they want. And they pick out Shamima Begum, who was, who was basically a child. She was, like, 15. She was groomed by, by Islamists and uh, taken, taken over. You know, she's, she's a, a, a victim in this. And they, they picked her out as this highly visible scapegoat for all that. It's like you're not dealing with the problem, and what you're doing is, is victimising somebody who, you know, all right, you know, I, I'm not hugely keen on getting her back in the country, but... You know, we'll do things on holiday. You know, things get out of hand. You know, you have a few <laughs> sangrias. Well, yeah, all I'm of a very, sudden you're yeah. throwing a plastic pool chair into the town fountain. You know, the, it's, yes, it's things, things get out of hand. I see what you mean, but uh, I'm very post liberal on this. I would not let her back in. But what about this idea that they could then do this to anyone and strip their citizenship, and that that's a bad pre precedent? Well, there's there's people that it would be a better idea to do it to than yeah. Uh, there's a long list, though, isn't there? Let's be honest. Because yeah. she's a homegrown problem. I think she's a problem Britain should really deal with. And she and she Britain should deal with the the whole of the problem. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on and do the Telegraph. And the army is making controversial changes to its accommodation plan. Let me guess: white men will have to sleep outside, Leo. <laughs> <Something> <laughs> like that. <laughs> They're it's not allowed. In, there's, there's no white men allowed in yeah, the army now. Uh, so the Ministry of Defence has been accused of an utter betrayal over a new military accommodation plan that will no longer allocate houses based on rank. So uh, servicemen and women are, along with their families, provided with, with accommodation on or near military bases, and staff have historically been rewarded with larger homes as they progress through the ranks. Uh, so now they're going to change it to, to allocating homes on the basis of how many children a serviceman or woman has. So this is going to mean that some officers uh, have to downsize and get, yeah. get put in, in sort of smaller, worse accommodation, which means, you know, some of these officers who are higher ranking are going to be forced out of the army uh, or, you know, they're going to want to leave and go into the private sector where they can make more money with their, the skills that they've got just at the time when we don't need and we don't want seasoned officers with lots of experience to be yeah. leaving the army because we need them. We're in the middle of a recruitment crisis, so we definitely don't want them to, to go. So it seems very... The only, the only small positive I can think of is that it might encourage people to have more babies. Yeah, but it is strange. It's another anti-meritocratic move. We mm. seem so against meritocracy. If you've earned a higher rank, why not have some reward from that? What's wrong with that? Yeah. But now this is some sort of utilitarian approach. And like you say, we, they already have a massive recruitment problem. They were talking about conscripting all of us. Yeah. What do you think, Francis? Look, I think that the issue here is, as well, is that we do not treat 
the people in our army and our armed forces particularly well. We need more investment to actually make sure that people when they go and they serve their country, their families are comfortable. We're not doing that. We're hemorrhaging uh, soldiers, we're hemorrhaging officers, and it's a really, really bad look, considering Putin is looking a little bit aggressive. Mm. Yeah, and it doesn't help, as we've said, when the RAF and so on say that white men are useless because they don't meet their diversity targets. So they yeah. need to get rid of this, but they also need to get rid of DEI and yeah. all that uh, nonsense. DEI should just be scrapped from every organisation. I think it will be, though. It is actually on the way out. We can mm. talk about that maybe later. It's but, baked in. But let's do The Guardian. And artificial intelligence is booming. Maybe soon it'll become sophisticated enough to know what a white person is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, US chip maker NVIDIA, I think they are, hits two trillion value amid AI boom. And this is a story about this company. So it took more than two decades for this company to hit a valuation of one trillion on the market less than nine months later it has doubled so essentially what is happening is we're going to be facing the end of the world pretty soon because of ai but don't worry about it because some nerd in uh in the valley, in Silicon Valley, is making shed loads. It's an incredible time to invest in AI because it's going to be so massive. It's like investing in the internet or money yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Although yeah. I, I think we might have missed the boat because this is already valued. Oh, yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah. $2 trillion. Yeah. Dollars. <laughs> yeah. If you want to buy them cheap, don't worry because China's going to invade Taiwan in a few years, which is oh, uh, Taiwan is where all the all the microchips are made. Yeah, so semiconductors. semiconductors. Yeah, We've all heard yeah, that. So that's one fact. Yeah. <laughs> AI is not going to destroy humanity. Like China's going to invade Taiwan, destroy humanity, and wipe out AI. Yeah but they've got oh, great cool. food. Yes. Always got to think about the food. All right, <laughs> hard to top that. That is it for part two. But coming up, Kim Jong-un's secret child and the mansplainer of the year. And no, it's not Leo or Francis. <laughs> See you in a minute. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Elon Musk has announced that the first patients to receive a groundbreaking ba brain implant from Neuralink is recovering well. This is all a bit odd. Uh, the product, called Telepathy, uses a robot to surgically place a computer chip in a region of the brain that controls movement. Hmm. Yes, Elon Musk says that the first goal is to enable people to control a phone or a computer just by thinking. He says that initial tests show promising signs of brain activity, meaning that patients with paralysis could one, one day overcome their conditions. Hmm, not sure about this one. Joining us to discuss this breakthrough is applied futurist Tom Cheesewright. Tom, this sounds, uh, well, slightly terrifying. <laughs> I certainly think a lot of people will be thinking this is something out of a sci-fi horror rather than reality. But this is a technology that's been a long time coming. We've been developing direct brain computer interfaces for a long time, mostly for the sort of therapeutic reasons that are the initial goal, at least, of Elon Musk's Neuralink, to allow people who are perhaps quadriplegic to have direct control via their brains of initially a smartphone uh, and maybe ultimately artificial limbs or a wheelchair. It does seem fascinating how quickly this technology is moving on. I, I saw demonstrations perhaps a year or two ago of people playing a very simple Pong game just by thinking, moving sort of one uh, line on a screen up and down. This seems like potentially there has been a breakthrough that means far more complex things can be controlled just by thinking. Well, there's lots of different aspects to this technology. The initial attempts to interface with the brain use actually quite thick prongs almost that went into the brain and they were quite solid and so if the brain moved they could potentially cause damage. 
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get straight into it with Saturday's Guardian. And a random bloke has tried to explain to a pro-female golfer how to play golf. Who is this absolute legend, Leo? Yeah, so this is a female pro golfer, golfer who is filming herself at a driving range who's trying out these sort of new techniques so she was going through the swing slowly. And this guy, uh, this guy saw her uh, doing it and uh, said, excuse me, what are you doing there? You shouldn't be doing that. You should be swinging and following through. Oh, we've got a clip we've got of a clip. Yeah, we can talk about it. It's, it's, it's basically, you see this Jeez, she wearing trousers? young lady who's very good yes. at golf and there's a scouse guy basically saying, here's what you want to do, love. You want to swing like this? I've been playing 20 years. Sorry for the accent, but that is roughly how it went down. Yeah, so she, and for anybody on radio, she's wearing trousers that are like flesh, like yoga pants that are flesh coloured. That, you know, that Le is Leo, a bit of a double take. <laughs> Le I mean, that's a niche show. Leo <laughs> describes <laughs> trousers. This is why the man came up to try and talk yeah. to her. Of course, it is why he talked to her. He's just trying to be friendly. He's just trying to talk to a woman, let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah. He's gone with the golf angle. He's misplayed it because she's really good at golf. Yeah. He's no way near as good at golf, almost certainly. But there's, too, there's so much of this stuff. There's like women shaming men at the gym and all this kind of thing. Yeah. But was this an example? Because in, in this case, to be fair, he was being quite annoying and she was a pro golfer. What do you think? He, well, he, I, was, he was just trying to help her. Yes. And she didn't appreciate it. You think, uh, she, all right, she's a pro golfer. This guy is probably very good at golf. Probably got some really good he's tips. Been, he's been playing 20 years. My favourite bit was when he goes, he goes, here's what you want to do. And then she goes back and then she deliberately does like an ultra amazing swing just to really... <laughs> yeah. And he goes, see how much better that one was? <laughs> it's like, as if he's done it. <laughs> the confidence. Yeah. Uh, so Listen, good. look. That could be two people meeting and falling in love. And then we'd be like, that's, that's a wonderful story. Imagine that was the start of something beautiful. Might be a bit of an age gap. If he's been playing 20 years, unless he started at, like, age one. Yeah. She seemed quite young. So it's like an old bloke at the driving range. That's, well, that's well, what women like these yeah, days. Yeah, exactly. They're all looking for a father figure. Yeah, thank God for Lana Del Rey. <laughs> yeah. she, she planted that seed in all women's heads. Yeah, heads. exactly. Outrageous. Where would we be without her? <laughs> OK, well, I think we pretty much nailed that one. Uh, yeah. Funny story. Let's do the mail. And Germany is set to legalise cannabis. I suppose one way to cope with the impending destruction of Europe is to be permanently stoned, Francis. <laughs> exactly. So Germany legalises cannabis, allowing possession of up to 25 grams and cultivating up to three plants for use. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about this is it was always going to happen. Four, four and a half million Germans are estimated to be using cannabis. But the reality is as well is that Germany's economy is going into free fall at the moment. They're desperately needing to diversify. So what do you do when you're really struggling for money? You get into drugs and you start selling it. It's the age-old story. This is yeah. basically Breaking Bad, but with Germans. On a massive scale. Yeah. A bit late, though, isn't it? Imagine it a bit late for Hitler. If he'd have been yeah. stoned up more, wouldn't it have chilled him out a bit? He well, might... he was on meth, wasn't he, Hitler? Uh, it's the wrong drug, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's the wrong he drug. Might, uh, he might have been, yeah, for angry His, his speeches, yeah. his speeches wouldn't have been as good. Yeah. yeah. But, but he'd have chilled out. Well, yeah. I just think this is a, this is a terrible move because the Germans are known for their efficiency yeah. and their orderliness. Yes. And, you know, if you know people who smoke weed, they're not... You don't, not you don't associate efficiency they're just, they're playing in Mario Kart in the middle of the day. Exactly. Yeah, and exactly. never get anything done. And never <laughs> progress with their lives. It's the worst drug, because at least with crack cocaine, you hit the bottom and you, you realise... Say what you like about crack cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe if Hitler was smoking weed and playing Mario Kart, Europe would have been a safer place. Well, that's what I'm saying, but... Yes, you're right, Germany's going to fall well, apart. Actually, what can... character do you think Hitler would have been on Mario Kart? Good question. Turtle. You think total? I think he would have been a bit Bowser. subversive. No, I think he would have been Princess Peach. Really? Yeah. That's shocking seeds. OK, I don't know how to top that. But, yeah, <laughs> I'm against this. I'm against the legalisation of all cannabis in all circumstances. Yeah. Sorry, Mike Tyson. Wouldn't say it if he was in the room. But other than that, <laughs> hey. I'm against it. Let's do The Guardian, then. And the UK birth rate has fallen to a record low. Maybe people just don't want to bring a new life into the country if it's going to be run by Keir Starmer, Leo. That was... 
yeah. one theory I had. Well, yeah, the birth rate in, in UK in the U, in UK follows the record low as campaigners say procreation is a luxury. So the total fertility was 1.49 children per woman in 2022. Uh, so just for context, you need a, a sort of fertility rate of 2.1. Uh, so yeah. women. I heard 2.5. This has 2.1. Yeah, yeah. Well, you need, something like that. You need 2.1 to have a sort of stable population. I, th yeah. I think it depends, you know, on, on your sort yeah. of um, uh, uh, mortality rate and stuff like that, which is obviously pretty low in Britain because, believe it or not, we are actually a, a modern uh, first world country. <laughs> oh, wait, uh, but yeah, they're, they're saying here that uh, rising housing and childcare costs are contributing to this. At the moment, only sort of the rich and the poor can afford to have yeah. children. If you're in the middle, both both people, both parents are, are working, it's very difficult to afford to have children. But I say, man, you got to go for it. I had a, I had a baby. It's the best thing I ever did. It's like the most fun and the most sort of soul enriching stuff. It's expensive, but you know, what are you going to use the money for? Anyway, what are you going to yeah. use the money for that's better than having a baby? The money thing is interesting. I was talking to Dr. Paul Mond, who's an expert on this topic, and he was saying we're actually richer than ever, you know, in a general sense. Yeah. So, so really, this idea we don't have enough money, yes, there's cost of living, but is it kind of a myth? Is it about what we prioritise as a culture? In other words, if you said, OK, you're going to have to leave London because you're prioritising having a child, you know, it's that sacrifice that people aren't necessarily willing to make. I can understand it's really difficult, but do we need to sort of socially promote this idea more of having children as a priority? Well, it's the, it's the cost of housing as well. So, yeah. uh, you know, the cost of housing has just exploded over the last, you know, around about four decades. And, and part of that is because uh, we've had a massive uh, rise in immigration. So everybody that comes here, they don't bring a semi-detached house with them. They need somewhere to live. Uh, so, you know, while we've been doing that and while we've been encouraging uh, both uh, both partners in a, in a couple to work, um, it, yeah. it, makes it, it makes it more expensive. But it is, I mean, childcare and things like that are just insanely expensive. Uh, yeah, and, a day. and also as well, I agree with all the points you made. The, the Conservative government and the Labour government have comprehensively failed when it comes to sorting out the issue of the housing crisis. I saw a statement by Michael Gove saying that if we don't build more houses, uh, the young people are going to reject democracy. I'm like, well, it's a good job you're not the housing minister, Michael. Oh, actually, you are, mate. Yeah. So what are you doing? No politician has seriously tackled this problem. It's, even though people like Elon Musk think it's the biggest problem facing humanity, yeah. there was this myth of overpopulation. Turns out we're going to have underpopulation. Yeah. And so many countries are facing this. Japan, 1.3. South yeah. Korea. 0.8. They have, we're yeah. on 1. Point, what was it, 4.9. So, yeah, it's yeah. a disaster. Italy, very low. So, and one thing, this idea of immigration is, is a temporary thing. It's, it's a Ponzi scheme because they yeah. get old. It doesn't work. Well, also, immigration, work, I mean, it's a Ponzi scheme, but we're bringing people in at the top. So many people come in and require state support. So instead Instead of you know coming in and fueling right. the economy, they're, they're coming in and costing more yeah. money, which is absolute insanity. And also, you know, economists say the economists just see people as sort of GDP generating nodes. So they say, oh, we should just have we can we can replace the fertility rate with uh, with just mass immigration. But I mean, we can already see the the problems that are that are arising from it, and the the problems with uh, with radical Islamism, for example, that didn't spring from Sal Salisbury yeah. in the you know twelve hundreds. Quite a disturbing stat is if we carry on at the same rate of decline in birth rate, by 2080, the population will be over 50% foreign-born if we want to keep our current dependency ratio of people in work to not in work. Yeah. So that's a radically different country with 50%, not just immigrants, but actually foreign-born. Yeah. It, it's not really a sustainable approach. Anyway, we've got to move on, but let's do the mail. And a trans man is going to do IVF using previously frozen eggs. So basically, a woman is having a baby. Is that correct? <laughs> 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 yeah. A woman is having a baby. And uh, they came here, wh whatever this person is, a trans man, they came here from Transylvania. It sounds like a pun, but it's actually... <laughs> but it's actually true. A trans man from Transylvania came to this country, uh, transitioned, then decided... Got a transit van. <laughs> yeah. Got a transit van, then decided some, they wanted to... Ate some trans, trans fats. <laughs> ate some trans like fat. Like margarine. Yeah, <laughs> decided they want to transition to be a mother, and they're having fertility treatment. And the world's gone nuts, and I, I don't, I don't want to live here anymore. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. You sound like a transphobe. Yeah, I I'd, yeah. I'd, I don't really see the problem with this. I mean, uh, the, I guess there's a mild concern that you know, if there's any drugs or hormones involved in, in yeah. transitioning, you know, that could affect the baby. But I'm sure they've, they've got doctors who know how to handle all that that sort of stuff. Apart from that, uh, you know, it's great. Two females having a baby. One of them's a trans, a trans man. I think that's that's pretty healthy. That's 
that's absolutely fine. That's a nuclear family right there. I'm all for it. Like, well, we... no, because they're using the sperm of yeah. some, some bloke. Yeah, yeah but it's still it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a, a, a mum and a dad. R kind of, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, a, it's, it's not. A, 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 yeah. a mum who was... What was a woman? Yeah, a mum and it's a mum and two mum. Now it's a man. You're saying. Yeah. You're accepting this transition is, is. Yeah, I think. I mean, come on. You never get any problems with uh, with trans men going into male changing rooms or trans <laughs> yeah, men yeah. going into m male prisons or anything. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't see a problem. Leo with a more liberal take. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Francis, although his wasn't that liberal. Let's do the <coughs> male. And Kim Jong Un has a secret son. He keeps out of the public eye. Not like North Korea to hide things, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Kim Jong Un has a secret son who's kept out of the public eye because he is too pale and thin. That is, fun enough, the same reason Francis has never exposed his genitals. The <laughs> bombshell claim was made by Cho Sog Yong, a retired official from uh, the intelligence service uh, in Korea. So, uh, apparently, for North Koreans, being chubby uh, is a sign of... Uh, is a status. Sign of status. Yeah, because you can afford power. food. Because yeah. everybody, everybody else is starving to death. Like, literally, it's, like it's like hip-hop videos. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yes. I think uh, a million people starved to death in, in North Korea uh, in the 90s. So now everybody uh, everybody wants to be, be plump. They even talk about Kim Jong-un's plump daughter uh, who's <laughs> entered yeah. the public eye. And he might pass on the succession to her instead. There's talk... Because yeah. apparently they haven't always followed the rules strictly in North Korea. They just kind of do what they want. Yeah. yeah. And he might leave this austere, thin son yeah. and go straight to the door. He's, he's probably just staying thin so like, his uncle doesn't feed him to pigs or something. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? yeah, it's just an absolutely bizarre story. Can you imagine people going, no, mate, you, you, you can't be the leader of, of this country. You're too thin. You're going to you're gonna need to get stuck into the pork chops, put some weight on, yeah. Yeah, and no, that's the no only way you're going to... No one's going to marry you. Look how well, thin yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can see your abs through that. It's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, they say here uh, that... Um, if you're fat in North Korea, then you project authority and you yeah. can intimidate people the in the generals. military. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I know we should all move. We can eat what we want. <laughs> yeah. So nice. So much Well, ice actually, cream. it's North Korea, so you can't, mate. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there are some downsides of living there, I hear. But the, all right, that is it for part three. <coughs> but coming up in the final section, the first private moon landing, and a man gets rich from listening to his wife's private phone calls. See you in a minute. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. So a new poll has revealed that Gen Z or Gen Z, I don't know how I'm supposed to say it, and British boys and men are more likely to believe that feminism has done more harm than good when compared with older respondents. So the polling also found that a quarter of UK males aged 16 to 29 believe it's harder to be a man than a woman, with one in five looking favourably upon controversial influencer Andrew Tate. 37% of them also agree that the phrase toxic masculinity is unhelpful. So, with Gen Z boys increasingly holding this view, has feminism done more harm than good? Let me know your thoughts. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. Tweet me, at gbnews, and make sure you take part in our poll. But I'll bring you those results shortly. Going head-to-head -head on this tonight, our author and commentator, Anna May Mangan, and YouTuber and social media influencer, Pearl Davis. Both of you, thank you very much. Pearl, I'll start with you. Has feminism done more harm than good, especially when it comes to these Gen Z boys? Um, yes, yes, it has. I, feminism really has turned into a bunch of crybaby women that want to complain that we're not given equal opportunity when really women are given more opportunity than men. Um, and so, yeah, I would say feminism is a hate group and it's a bunch of crybaby women. Uh, Anna, would you like to come back to that? Crybaby women feminism, apparently. So we've got a right lad with us tonight with Pearl, in her opinions, haven't we? How could it possibly do harm? Pearl wouldn't do... I hope you vote. I assume you do. I hope you're not chained to the kitchen sink at home. Um, I'm not sure if you've got a job. I'm sorry, I don't know very much about you. But uh, you're if there's a bloke doing the same thing as you, you're probably earning less than him. So, of course, feminism is something that... It got us the vote in the first place, and it's still doing a power of good. It's just whingy men... And actually, I, I changed that. They're lads, they're not men. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get into it with the Mail and the so-called lesbian Nana Cop who arrested the autistic teenage girl in that awful video, you may remember, has been forced to apologise. A rare, heartwarming story, Francis. Well, quite. So, we all remember that uh, video that went viral on TikTok and all across uh, the internet uh, with the, the girl who got arrested, the autistic girl who got arrested, because she told uh, this female police officer that she looked like a lesbian Nana. And, you know, she got arrested. It was disgusting. It was an overreach. The police the police force quite rightly apologised. Yeah, I, the thing is, the thing that I find frustrating about these stories is there are so many crimes that go unprosecuted. There's so many burglaries. There are so many assaults where nothing happens. The victim is simply given a crime reference number and just told to get on with it. And then you have this poor girl getting arrested at the age of 16. It just seems to me that the police have actually lost any idea of what they're meant to be doing. Yeah, so yeah, I, and it, God, it was very heavy-handed. So it's good to see the apology. But yeah, God. well, I think I think it's this pol police officer in particular, and I think you know because there's all this diversity and inclusion training in all the public sector, especially the the police, they're they're sort of told that yeah, if anybody you know doesn't use your pronouns or whatever, yeah, you can scramble a SWAT team. You can totally yeah shoot shoot to kill if they if they misgender you, shoot to kill. That's you know that's essentially what what people are told. Maybe not quite. Yeah, yeah. It, seemed, it seemed sort of regime bullying because yeah, she, oh she made this homophobic. But comic. Yeah. Never mind that she was an autistic teenager who just didn't know any better yeah. and wasn't even trying to be nasty. And yeah. never mind the hom homophobic comments, you know, all kinds of comments, all nasty comments. Like uh, it's it's just it's just words. It's just somebody yeah, yeah. mouthing off. But then but also, it, but then it wasn't even with her, homophobic. With her being disabled, maybe that's why there was a, a bit of a backlash. Or it could have just been that we saw the video and it was awful. Yeah, it's because we saw with the video it was awful. She was clear. She was autistic. She was clearly highly distressed. It was very upsetting to watch. And also, as well, the fact you can tell it wasn't a nasty, a nasty thing to say because she says you look like my lesbian nana, my grandmother, yeah. the, the woman who I love more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. it was ridiculous. All right. Yeah. Well, my, my nana's bisexual. She's a banana. <laughs> nice. That's why we pay him the big bucks, guys. Let's do... That's why he's got his own show. Let's do The Guardian. And a man has been accused of making $1.8 million from listening in on his wife's work calls. Another candidate for Legend of the Week, Leo. So, uh, so US man accused of making $1.8 million from listening in on wife's remote work calls. This is basically... His, his wife uh, worked for BP mm -hmm. and was uh, doing some sort of merger and acquisition of some other uh, company. And he listened. He heard. His wife was on the phone talking about it. He just heard through the through the door or whatever. Uh, so he bought... He heard about this deal coming up. So he bought loads of shares in the company, which then went up 71%. Uh, and, uh, and then he uh, confessed to his wife and, uh, and claimed that he'd bought the shares so she could have a nice life or whatever. And she grassed him up to BP. This is the level of woman Disgusting. that men have Listen. to live with these days. She grassed him up. And the, the good news is she got fired by BP after grassing him up. So yeah. she should have just kept stum. Because I wondered this... for a second, like, did she actually tell him? But once, as soon as I saw that she grassed him up and divorced yeah. him, I was like, oh, no, she probably didn't. Listen, it, this just proves that nothing you ever do is good enough. Yeah. This man made over 1.8 million, 1.4 million, whatever it was... 1.8 million dollars, 1.4 million pounds, yeah, yeah to, to help her. To help her, to make her life better. Not for himself in any way. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because he knows that a marriage is between a man and a woman and that they, they, they are together in unison and she betrayed him. Yeah. Shame on you. Yeah, and why wouldn't he think he could do it when Nancy Pelosi and yeah. all these other people are, are uh, having it such incredible good luck on the stock market? Um, I'm sure completely above board and without using any of their political insider knowledge. Absolutely. It, was, it is completely above board, I'm sure I have to say. So, um, one last thing. This is the elephant in the room is work from home. It doesn't yeah. work. No, it's it doesn't work. another reason why. 
It, the, the work for working from home never works. People mess around. They never do what they're meant to do. And they accidentally get rich off insider information. Yeah, which is why we're here. We should be working from home. Work, <laughs> working from home is, is great. I think, it's, I think it's really good. The whole presenteeism of getting all dolled up and going at the office is a nonsense. Okay. No, it's not. It's it how is. people meet. It's how romance Ask if you can do your TV show from home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd like right. to. Let's yeah. do the independent. And the first private moon landing has taken place, or as some people on the internet call it, the first moon landing, friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, on the independent, <laughs> the first private moon landing on moon hailed historic milestone for lunar exploration. Uh, and it's the first time that there has been a moon landing, or US moon landing, uh, f since 50 years ago. But here is the thing. It was heavily financed by the government. So, is it that private? Mm, I am not sure. They're probably just trying to compete with Russia again. Uh, yeah. What do you think, Leo? Oh, they've got a oh, picture there. There's some footage there. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, CGI um, recreation. The whole yeah. thing was, was done in, inside a computer. This is the thing, landing on the moon. And if, in the full clip, a Scouse man comes up and explains how to <laughs> land it yeah. on the moon even better. So, but it's interesting to see the difference between the moon landing in the 60s, which was faked using Hollywood studios, yeah. and this one, which is faked using computers. Yeah. Great point. It's yeah, more exactly. realistic than the first film. Do you I, think they went? No, I was just going to say, I was going to make a joke, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah, do it's it. about the Scouse man. Go and do the Basic, joke. Yeah, but just going along and nicking something from the thing. It Nick doesn't have the moon. Yeah. yeah, great point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, we've got 30 seconds. Do you want to do the next one or do you want to do this one? Uh, oh, oh, let's do oh. the final one. This is no, the best story of the whole thing. We can't just randomly pick one. Oh, that is true. All right. We can do the sun one if you want to All do right. yeah. yeah, so the sun erupts with its most powerful solar flare in seven years. That's apparently going to wreak havoc on GPS and satellites. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is... You might see a flash in the sky. Are we going to see a flash in the sky? I don't think we will, because you can't look at the sun. No. Yeah, I'm surprised the sun erupting is this far down the running order, but I, I think it's it's not actually going to be do destroyed anything. or anything. No, yeah. no. I think nothing will happen. OK, yeah. well, thanks, lads. That is the show pretty much over. But let's have another quick look at Saturday's front pages. So, the Daily Telegraph has Health Secretary gives backing to decriminalisation of abortion. The Daily Mail, vile cat killer who went on to murder. The Express, Esther, my joy MPs can bring in right to die law. The I, UK offers Russian officials British citizenship to defect and pass secrets to MI6. The Mirror has King and Tonic. And finally, the Daily Star, Mamma Mia, that important story we did about spaghetti bolognese. So that is pretty much it for tonight's show. Thanks to Leo and Francis. Headlines will be back tomorrow at 11pm. And if you're watching at 5am, then stay tuned for breakfast. But for now, it's good night or indeed good morning and God bless. Warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening, welcome to your latest GB News weather update with me, Annie from the Met Office. It'll be a chilly start to the weekend. There will be some early sunshine though, but a risk of showers developing in the afternoon. Low pressure has been in charge through today. That will slowly start to fill, bringing us a slightly more settled evening and Saturday. So any showers through the day will tend to fade away through the course of the night, but they will still persist across some western coasts and across the far southeast as well, where it could be quite breezy overnight. Elsewhere, though, it will be a clear and calm and dry night. The so temperatures will drop away, so it's likely to be quite a cold start to the day on Saturday. So frost, potentially some icy patches, and also some mist and fog by tomorrow morning. That should lift and clear by mid-morning, and many areas will see a dry and bright day through Saturday. The best of the sunshine will definitely be through the morning. Cloud will bubble up into lunchtime and into the afternoon, allowing a few showers to develop. These should be fairly few and far between and they will be quite light if you do get caught in one. In the sunshine it will be feeling fairly pleasant as well with those light winds. It will be another cold start to the day on Sunday but across northern areas it should stay dry and bright through much of the day. In the south though quite a different story with some quite persistent wet weather set to arrive across southern areas of England possibly into parts of South Wales too. Turns dry up more widely once again on Monday before further wet weather arrives in the north on Tuesday. See you later. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us at 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. The Camilla Tomini Show, Sunday mornings from 9.30. Yeah, I appreciate the story isn't in today's papers, but it has been running all week, and it's yes. this row over um, the use of nitrogen hypoxia to kill this man who was on death row in... Um, Alabama. Alabama, yeah. And it's been linked back to you, and I wanted to ask you about it because this is intriguing, because you did a television show back in 2015 where you, I believe, tested this method of execution. Just tell me briefly about it, Michael. What happened? I didn't test this method of execution, and it was a bit longer ago than that. But what I did do was test hypoxia. So for I, I tested various ways in which people uh, are killed in the United States, and and asked the question as to whether there was a hum more humane way of doing it. So I was put into hypoxic situations, for example, into a chamber run by the Netherlands Air Force, which simulated what happens if you're in an aircraft at 30,000 feet and suddenly the windows blow out. And what happened to me was that I was almost instantly rendered incapable. Uh, as an experiment, I was trying to play with children's toys, putting triangle shapes into triangle spaces. And I'm I was quickly unable to do that. I was asked, what is 9 minus 5? And I said, 5. Mm. And then the, um, the officer who was with me, the uh, Air Force officer, who was wearing an oxygen mask, said to me, Michael, put your mask on or you will die. And I was incapable of putting my own mask on. Now, this suggested that hypoxia was very fast acting. Yeah. And that you had... Obviously, I was in no pain or anything no. like that. I was just completely unaware. By the way, this is why if you're on an aircraft and, and it depressurizes, you must put your own mask on first. But of okay. course, I can't, I can't go on and draw conclusions. No. We, we did not experiment with nitrogen. But what I can say is it was, it was evident to me that hypoxia renders you incapable almost instantaneously. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World, and tonight on the show, we've got Lieutenant General Sir Simon Mayall. We've also got political commentator Matthew Stadler. He's going head-to-head -head with Peter Whittle. Also got author Inya Diecki, and we've got a legend of TV on tonight, that is John Lyons. But first, let's go to the news. Thanks, Lee. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. Our top stories. Police have confirmed three children whose bodies were found at a home in Bristol died from knife injuries. Seven-year-old Faris Bash, three-year-old Jury and nine-month-old Mohammed were found in the Sea Mills area on Sunday. The 42-year-old woman, arrested on suspicion of their murder, remains in hospital and is being treated for non-life-threatening injuries. The vigil is due to be held in memory of the children. Former Post Office Chief Executive Paula Venels has been stripped of her CBE by the King following the Horizon IT scandal. She was heavily criticised for routinely denying any problems with the system, which led to the wrongful prosecution of hundreds of sub-postmasters. She received the honour in 2018 and announced that she planned to hand it back with immediate effect last month. She will now formally lose the title for bringing the honours system into disrepute.
An unexploded Second World War bomb found in Plymouth has now been successfully taken out to sea. The 500-kilogram unexploded device was found in a garden in Keyham and was successfully lifted onto a military vehicle. 10,000 residents are now being allowed to return to their homes following its removal. Local MP Johnny Mercer thanking emergency responders who worked around the clock. Former Tory MP Bob Stewart has had his racially aggravated public order conviction quashed on appeal at Southwark Crown Court. Mr Stewart was convicted last November after he was accused of telling activist Saeed Ahmed al Wadeh to go back to Bahrain. That was during a row outside the Foreign Office. Mr Justice Benethan said that while the words spoken by Mr Stewart amounted to abuse, he did not believe that it caused Mr al Wadeh harassment, alarm or distress. An asylum seeker has been sentenced to nine years and six months for the manslaughter of four migrants who drowned trying to cross the Channel. In a retrial at Canterbury Crown Court, Ibrahima Barr was found guilty of piloting an unseaworthy inflatable between France and the UK in December of 2022. He claimed that smugglers threatened to kill him if he refused to drive the boat, but the prosecution said he owed the passengers a duty of care. Well, for the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code that's on your screen right now, or why not go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now let's get straight back to Lee Anderson's Real World. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World, and tonight I'm joined by Sir Simon Mayhill, Lieutenant General, is that right? Correct. And also, back as left in the corner. He's smiling away there. We've got Matthew Sadlin. He's the, uh, the voice, of, voice of socialism. The, vo right? the voice of reason, I think they say. The voice of reason. Common uh, sense. Serious point, um, Sir Simon. Two years tomorrow, we saw the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. Yeah. It's a war we keep saying, you know, Russia take ground, then the Ukraines fight back. With the backing, the generous backing of, of, of the West, we know that Russia's being backed by other countries, yep. uh, such as Iran and, and China. North Korea, China. Is it a war that Ukraine can win? It's a very difficult war for them to win on their own, Lee. Um, we should all be extremely grateful that the initial aid we gave to Ukraine two years ago stopped Putin's attempt to decapitate the uh, Ukrainian regime and defeat the Ukrainian army, we'd be left with a very difficult and different situation. Because the Ukrainians have held on remarkably well. We could be in such a different place. Uh, but uh, their resources are finite. Yeah. They absolutely depend on Western support or Allied support to stay in the field. Yeah. Uh, and if they do, don't get it, the Russians have over Charles Speed. But why is it, it, Simon? Why is it, Simon, that it's so important to help Ukraine? Because it is a very strategic country for us in, in the West. It's a very strategic country. I think people don't quite realise how important it is for gas, for minerals, for grain. Um, and you'll remember the stoppage of grain by, by um, Roscoe. Let alone the fact that it's, it's standing up to blatant aggression yeah. by Russia, which, as we know, having seen Navalny being killed the other day, is under the leadership of an absolute psychotic, you know, paranoid, delusional leader. And if Ukraine collapses, then where, do, where are the Baltic states? Where is Poland? Where's the NATO alliance, uh, particularly when we know some of the issues that have been debated in America at the moment and uh, Trump's latest thing? So it's really important the, the Ukrainians prevail in this and they need Western support. We're not exactly putting our own troops on the line. Exactly. So the, Ukrainians are, the Ukrainians are paying the, the blood, we're paying the treasure. So that's a fair point, Matthew, that we're not putting troops on the front line, but we're, we're coughing up financially, with are armed, we're supporting Ukraine. You're on the left of politics. Are we doing the right thing? I think we're doing the right thing. And it's important, though, to check ourselves and to keep having this conversation two years on, because you think of how many Ukrainians have died. I mean, obviously, that is a Ukrainian decision. But I think just by last summer, 70,000 or something, 70,000 Ukrainian troops had been killed. That is a gobsmacking number. If you think of the, the families affected by that and the friends, so many